Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Michael, you've returned to the show. I did, yeah. I keep coming back, no matter how many times we try to kill me. My name is Eric, and uh, since both of us are here, this is an episode of Double Feature. But not just any episode of Double Feature. That's right. The Killapaloozas are back. The Killapaloozas have returned. What are we doing on this here, Killapalooza? (laughs) Because no matter how often we try to kill them... (laughs) I think people were afraid because we uh, we hadn't. Yeah, I don't think we've done a Killapalooza in you know six or seven months or something. Yeah, I think what would be really apropos is if eventually, you know, when uh, Richard Branson finally gets those fucking space flights up and running that cost however many thousands of dollars. Oh my god, I know exactly where this is going. You want to uh-huh. do a Killapalooza in space? Do a Killapalooza in space. <laughs> oh man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because we have the funding for that. We'll just won't be a problem. I don't know. Kickstart it. Believe me, if I ever find myself in space, I will FaceTime you. I just assume of the two of us, I'm getting to space first. That's yeah. Let's not lie to ourselves here. That's what's going to happen. Um, we're doing critters this time, and I guess it's been even longer than six months. What well, the last the last Killapalooza we did was the eye. Wow, I remember this because it was uh Killapalooza 18, making this Killapalooza 19. And uh, the big two zero is coming up if we're just going to, you know, cite arbitrary numbers. 20 is more important than 19. Wow. But that doesn't mean we don't have a jam-packed fucking show today. That's right. In which we're going to spoil the movies. Yeah, we're going to spoil the movies. We're going to uh, spoil all of them. Now, what if I don't want to get spoiled, but I've only seen Critters uh, 1, 2, and 4? Because that's probably a real thing. That's uh, that's really interesting that you should ask that. Um We have the chapters thing where you can use your AAC file and you can chapter right on, uh, you can chapter from this early section where we discuss the films we're doing and where we came from today and such things as chapters and spoilers. You can chapter right on to the first Critters. Critters 2, what's it called? The New Batch or Hungrier Than Heaven? I think they're actually, I didn't even look this time around. The only one it just the upsets me. only one with a subtitle is Critters 2. Really? It's Critters, Critters 2, colon, Friday the Hungry Teenth. Oh, Critters 2, the main course. There I we go. I'm looking on the internet. Critters, Critters 2, the main course. Then you could chapter right over Critters 3 and go uh, watch Critters 4. The main derif. I don't. <laughs> oh God. Oh man, we eventually get to go to Critters Four. I can't wait for that. I, you know, I'm looking at the cover of Critters Two though, and it just says Critters Two. I also see that the IMDb page just says Critters Two. I think I'm gonna go ahead and chalk this up to successful titling for uh, <laughs> for the Critters franchise. I think I'm gonna give them credit for that. Um, yeah, so we're going to spoil the movies. You haven't seen any of the Critters movies anyways, so and you're still going to listen to the show, and nothing I can say or do will talk you out of it. So, uh, you know, ruin it for yourself, buddy. Um, the first Critters movie. So here we are. Feels weird to be back in Killapalooza, it? does. It? it does, but there's, there's a thing in Critters, the very first Critters film, mm-hmm. that makes me feel so much more comfortable uh, than... I would initially feel and it's in those opening credits and for one of the first times on double feature it has nothing to do with the director because I couldn't tell you who directed this <laughs> but what I can tell you is who does the critters yeah not only do they do the critters in the first film but they go ahead and they do all the creature effects for critters in all four films so we already get what's his name Barry Don Opper the actor who plays Charlie Oh yeah, yeah, so yeah. Okay, he's sure. our he's our overarching hero through these films. But for Don me, Keith Opper is his name. That's who you wanted. For me, the real hero of the Critters franchise is the Chiodo brothers. I don't know though, and I mean, I don't know if you have this information. I know they're credited in all four movies, but my assumption was they worked on the Critters in the first one, and then it's kind of like you know characters by Wes Craven. Maybe. I don't know. I don't see why they would do that. 
Well, they created the critters. I think they might be given credit for, hey, you guys made the critters. That's an idea you had. Or a, you know, uh, you created the look and the whatever. I think it might be characters by the Chiodo brothers. I don't know. I don't know either. I don't, I don't want to think about that. So before, yeah, so we're just ch- going to assume they, they showed up for every film and made the, the creature effects. Well, the Chiodo brothers are the, they're the creature effects guys. Mm-hmm. They did Killer Clowns. That's their big, that's their directorial uh, debut, which we talked about a little bit last week. Yeah, when we talked about pacifist clowns. <laughs> um, they did killer clowns from outer space. They did all the creature effects and the weird prosthetics. And I mean, they are one of the creepiest group of people to have do your monster effects. Sure. I mean, you go to Tom Savini when you want some realistic gore. You go to John Carl Buechler when you want something, some, I don't know, some because he's in charge of Hatchet. That's pretty horrendous. <laughs> sure. But nothing is as creepy as the realistic nature of the critters can we go back for a second did you mean to use the word horrendous is that the correct word you want to use to describe hatchet i i guess not full of horror perhaps yes well you said horrendous it's recorded i'm keeping it (laughs) listen these kill bluesers run long i don't have time for all this crazy editing stuff you uh want to do on the show i'm sorry so what is a critter crites crites thank you that's what i wanted the critters are uh they're a species of alien that are apparently criminal (laughs) sure um because they're being taken to a space prison in the beginning of this film um so they're sentient enough to commit crimes in the universal sense and they break loose and they fly their spaceships to earth with the intention of eating the planet well, we know they're sentient because they talk to each other using language that is translatable into English. That's true. <laughs> One of my favorite things about the critters as a monster character, mm-hmm. or I guess a slasher, we might, we're on Killapool, so we'll just call the critters a slasher uh, collectively, is that they communicate via subtitle. Yep. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, and the franchise pretty much sticks with that. It's, it's one of actually a lot of things that I think the franchise, we often find that the franchises with fewer movies keep more things. Sure. They don't, you know. Well, and it's easier because eventually you. Not as many films for them to fuck up. Exactly. The, right. The staples. Although there are those franchises that just fuck up right off the bat too. <laughs> right. Well, you, you want to talk about great right off the bat. I mean, we nail it. We hit a newest record for quickest time to space. Yeah, in I any know. Killapalooza franchise. I know. I don't even think when we did uh, Alien and Predator, yeah, that we were in space this quickly. <laughs> I mean, it, technically, we're always in space on every movie we do because uh-huh. we're in space on the planet Earth. Wow. Uh, That's right now, deep. I'm just saying. You know, if we want to really, I don't want to go handing out awards and wrongfully give it to you know the wrong franchise. But yeah, we're literally hanging out in a spaceship flying through space, first frame of the movie. Mm-hmm. And space becomes something that the uh, the films are very comfortable with, and anytime they think they have the budget, they will sure. uh, fucking return to. Well, it's weird because unlike a lot of the other franchises we've covered, Critters seems to be one of the only franchises that is firmly planted in space. Yeah, sure. And Earth just happens to be a battleground. Well, that's what I mean when we're talking about the alien and predator stuff. Right. Is I, you know, I should know before I say something like this how the original alien movie starts because that's probably a very easily sure findable thing. But I'm going to be uh, blissfully ignorant and just not know. But unless it starts where we can actually see stars in space, that's what I'm going to say gets mm-hmm. you the uh, the space award. Yeah, that gets you the space award. Exactly. And so this this film um, critters a lot of people, and I don't know about you, Eric, but a lot of people see a lot of similarities between critters and gremlins. <laughs> really? You think so? And what's really fascinating about it is that the first critters script was written maybe five years before the first gremlins movie ever came out. No way. And really? That yes, and that initially. Are you sure about that? I'm sure. I'm skeptical of this. And that apparently upon the release of Gremlins, 
they had to alter a lot of the Critters film to make it even less like Gremlins than it already is. Interesting. So I came to the table, I came to the table thinking Critters was some exploitative take on Gremlins that ended up getting more sequels. Right, me too. But apparently it's its entire own franchise that Gremlins derailed by coming out first. <laughs> That's a belief I still have trouble letting go of, despite the fact you've told me it's wrong. Yeah. I just can't. It's a narrative I can't abandon uh, in my head. There's so many things I like about the Critters franchise that, that start in the first that I'm trying to think of what is everything that we're not going to see again that we have to talk about right now. Harvey is a person I recognize, so I'm always uh-huh. excited in Killapaloozas when I see actors I recognize. Mm-hmm. Who's that? It's uh, Emmett yeah. Walsh, I think. Mm-hmm. Who, I mean, he was in Blood Simple, but he did a voice um, for a movie we did on our show, uh, The Iron Giant. Yeah. Where we get to, we man, we tagged a bunch of people in that episode who we only get to refer back to as the people who are on The Iron Giant. But he also, actually, while we're talking about movies I never thought we'd fucking hear of ever again, do you remember we did Piranha? Yes, I remember. And, <laughs> good, you're with me so far. Now, you especially gave me a hard time about this uh, when I mentioned director Scott Levy and his other film, uh, Men in White, which was a, you know, fucking parody-esque thing of Men in Black. Mm-hmm. And you thought, yeah, there is a film that'll never fucking come up again. Emmett Walsh in Men in White. <laughs> so take that, Michael Kester. Tag twice on double feature. Men in White. I'm just going to be looking for an opportunity. You know, if you tag to... a film three times, it's got to come on the show. That's one of the rules. That's what happened with Blade Runner. Yeah, too bad it died in that year one studio fire. Uh, also, music by David Newman, mm-hmm. who, God, didn't expect that to happen. But David Newman, uh, he did the score for, fuck, I mean, every popular comedy kids movie of the last 30 years. Mm-hmm. He did, um, specific to our show, probably, I can only think of two off the top of my head, Serenity and Death to Smoochie. That's a good pair right there, man. Yeah. Those are five-star films, in my opinion. So to see him show up on Critters... God, I love the early, I love the early installments of Killapaloozas because you have all these people get involved who don't know what they're getting involved right. in yet. Well, and, and then the late installments where no one will touch it, so you sure. get the most like, ah, uh, no one's even going to see this movie. We can do whatever the fuck we want. It's interesting with with the first Critters movie because you're introduced to a family and a town and some aliens. I mean, you get the makings of a fantastically cohesive franchise. Sure, sure. And all you need to do, all anyone ever needs to do in a horror franchise is hang on to those characters. <laughs> right. Um, you get you get the family Somehow that's so hard for everybody though. Well, you get the you get you get your nice farm family which is just perfect for a film like Critters because there's plenty of random animals to get devoured sure and plenty of of creepy places for the critters to be hiding and you know the the father's not afraid of anything and your house is easily exploded and rebuilt right you just get all these things that make for a really good family unit i mean it's it's fairly similar to the first leprechaun movie remember i was gonna say yeah it reminded me i was trying to think of what especially charlie and the kid yeah i was trying to remember exactly what what fucking franchise was that but you're right leprechaun and uh, was it the first one it's the first one with jennifer aniston's nose and they're painting yeah exactly and uh and so and then we get the introduction of ugg and lee get it and uh oh i didn't until you said that (laughs) <laughs> oh ugg coming in as an 80s new wave sort of <laughs> hair singer i don't even what genre would you call that kind of hair metal sort of ballad? It's, it's power pop man yeah that's your power the pop right there oh yeah that's i don't know that i've ever heard power like pop in the 80s don henley the boys of summer okay yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah, yeah 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 when i think power pop i think about all the stuff that happened in the 90s or uh even billy idol yeah, right. No, you're totally right. It's definitely okay. 
glad I have you around. <laughs> I would have no idea what happens in music fucking ever. But you're right. This I, is just something I realized in the last couple of years <laughs> is I can just ask you anything I don't understand about music and you just go, oh, this. Yeah. Thank you. And the thing that's great about that is that they're approaching planet Earth with the under the guise of don't stir up too much trouble. And <laughs> sure. the one shapeshifter character goes, hmm. I will become the number one most famous musician in the country. <laughs> well, and he does so in that great transformation skull oh, scene, too, so which good. I really like. So yeah. good. Reverse yeah. melting, man. I mean, you can reverse yeah. melt anything, and I'm on board. It's kind of gross and kind of freaky, and yeah, it's great. And then, But yeah, uh, you're right. Then the other guy goes, well, how can I top this? I know. I just won't transform at all. Mm -hmm. If there's anything less inconspicuous than most famous musician, we're going to go with, uh, you know glowing green head <laughs> i want to actually come back for a second though the the transformation skull thing was reminding me you know you were talking about how you thought the family element and the horror element were a perfect natural combination having farm life and so forth mm -hmm. being great fodder for the critters that was something and all throughout the franchise but most specifically in the first one it always stood out to me about Critters as a strange thing, how the movie was kind of a light family film, mm -hmm. but then also has this violent turn sure. where it's, you know, it's a dirty slasher, bloody monster thing. Right. And it's also warm family film. Right. When we saw Gremlins and with a lot of those kind of movies we saw, they... Uh, I think they fell more on the side of family film and just had a little bit of a bent to them mm -hmm. where Critters is really, I think of anything, it's probably more horror and more creature than it is family. But just seeing those two things come together, I always thought that was kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, it's perfect and it's great, but it does seem like something that stands out about Critters. But you don't, you don't ever feel like when it's getting kind of like, family oriented that 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 doesn't really stand out to you well it does but i think that that plays into the comedy element for me and here's why and it's one person one actor in this film is why i think that that's a perfect synergy between the obscene violence and the warm family life and it's the fact that they have d wallace playing the mother of this family sure so i don't know if you're aware of this eric but d wallace was also very notably the mother in E.T. Oh, I didn't know that. And so to have your matriarch figure be the matriarch of the most famously right, alien right. invaded family in the history of film. Sure. Uh, immediately lets you draw parallels of oh, warm family life because E.T. being a Spielberg movie is very warm and very emotional. And so to have this matriarchal figure be the head of a warm family, but unlike E.T., these aliens yeah. are going to eat your cat. Yeah, right. Or EDT. One other thing that the first Critters film does that I've been looking for uh, since it happened on our show is we have the Critters pillow fight scene. <laughs> and we finally, we couldn't get Journey for the Critters pillow fight scene. So we go close up on a photo. <laughs> and I have been waiting for another close up on a photo. I thought we would get one. <laughs> Do you want to explain that since uh, the last time it happened on the show, I think it came out of your mouth and unfortunately uh, we haven't been able to return to it. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? That scene where it's clearly a journey yeah. song, but it's actually not a journey song. Right. It plays again in the credits. Yeah. Uh, no, you're, it's not close up on a photo. It's uh, photos of you. <laughs> right. It's photos of you, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry close about a photo was another th was it also from that uh franchise i think that, so. that happened yeah yeah photos of you sorry photos of you it's uh it's the photos of you is this wonderful thing that happened i also, like how you just spent the last seven minutes cracking up it took you so long to stop <laughs> laughing to correct me but yes photos of you uh, also interestingly photos of you leprechaun that was a leprechaun yes. thing yeah um, okay so photos of you is this thing. I've been that... looking so much at these photos of you. <laughs> we're never going to, people who didn't listen to that show have no idea what we're talking about. Well, no, they can because we have a lexicon now. Oh, that's true. And yeah. uh, you can just go on doublefeatureshow.com and pull up our lexicon to see the definition of photos of you. But uh, yeah, to, to sum it up, basically 
photos of you is this technique that films use, wonderful technique, where they blatantly rip off a popular song uh, and then stick it in their film so that you sit there and for a second actually go, wait, is this Journey? No, this is not Journey. Right. But it sounds enough like Journey that I'm getting the same feeling. Yeah, right. So you don't want to get rights. You don't want to pay for rights. Or maybe they don't give them to you. I think in most cases, it's a money thing. Sure. But there might be some cases where Journey just goes, we don't want to be part of Critters. <laughs> We're not a- Or Gremlins got the rights to Journey first. Yeah. <laughs> that might be Gremlins snagged the, uh, you know, the usage. But I love the... So it's called uh, Photos of You because of the Cure song that's ripped off in that franchise, Pictures mm-hmm. of You. Right. And in that franchise, it was so... I remember seeing it in that movie, and it was dead on. Yeah. I, even, I think it might have even been the same melody. I don't even know if they did the good old <laughs> one-note switch. I think it might have just been blatant copyright <laughs> infringement. Almost borders on a cover. And in the song here, they only use the Journey-esque bit. It's so lazy. They use right. it for the first you know, four measures. And then they just go right back into score. Yeah. And they do it again. So the actual piece of music, it's not like they have one piece of music cue pseudo journey that they use and then they go back to the score. The song has like a journey intro Mm -hmm. and it's just a song that sounds like the rest of the score, but has a journey intro for that scene. Right. (laughs) And when they go back to it in the credits, it's the same kind of thing, but there's more kind of journey element Mm -hmm. of it. It's really funny. Critters 2 keeps a lot of the same characters. Critters 2 is, for me, it's the strong one. A lot of times we do these horror franchises and you take, I mean, you could take one out of every five and it's pretty clear that the first film is going to be your strongest one because it has nothing to live up to and all it gets to do is start precedence and then it doesn't have to follow up on anything. Sure, sure. That's not the case with Critters. While I enjoy the first Critters film, I feel like Critters 2 knows exactly how to further the first film's agenda. Sure. We get uh, we get most of the same cast, like you said. We get the little boy all grown up coming back to his hometown. Uh, Harv got ousted as the sheriff, but he's still around, although not played by Emmett Walsh. <laughs> That's so funny. And uh, and, just keep doing this. You used to be the sheriff. Yeah. And no, no, you really didn't. (laughs) And uh, replaced by a guy who's 20 years younger. (laughs) I'm sorry. I don't mean to dwell on it, but it's the funniest fucking. They didn't even try. And we get Charlie and Ugg and Lee all come back. Apparently, Charlie boarded the uh, spaceship with the uh, bounty hunters. And um, everybody just returns. And it's it's just a wonderful way to do Critters 2. Yeah, they up the ante so much more with the second film, and and that again with something like monster horror, like Critters, where it's it's not something like Halloween, where you bring in Michael Myers again, but this time he has to be even scarier and more vicious. Yeah, right. You have to figure out a way to make these critters different and more uh, fierce than they were the first time, and I think. I know this is blowing the film's load really early, but I think the thing that this film does that for me will go down in Killapalooza history as one of the most terrifying moments is giant munchy critter ball. I know. Well, it's also the cover of the movie. I mean, yeah, the movie knows that it's a big fucking deal, but yeah, it's really, uh, really iconic. Yeah. When you think back to critters, I think if you have a two sentence conversation with anybody who saw the Critters franchise, you know, as it was coming out or whatever, um, late night TV, that kind of thing, they're going to go giant Critters ball. What about that one? Yeah. Which one is that? It's the second one. And it's amazing. Yeah. The, the kind of horror effects and the, you know, hyping up the Critters even more and getting a bigger idea of, Mm -hmm. I mean, we're continuing the family violence, first of all, but this time the backdrop is even cheerier and even sure. brighter colored and probably i mean i don't know tell me what you think but probably more violent oh yeah yeah it's more violent and you're right everything about it is just amped up we realized that you know we had these elements in the first one that really worked and we thought 
you know, it doesn't always work this way, but a lot of times you just bring them even further into the extremes, especially when it's things that are contrasting, Mm -hmm. you know, things like family life and monster violence. Right. Let's push them even further apart. What could we do? I don't know. Easter day parade pageant thing. (laughs) And it's just set against this, uh, this cheerful spring background. Right. I I think it's great. They also kept the critter subtitles. So this was officially, I mean, that was my spot to go, all right, what are we going to lose? I was fearful. Sure. And, you know, as soon as you see the the critter subtitles. What about when you see the Easter, the bloody Easter bunny jump through a church window and take out the altar? <laughs> that didn't win it over for you? Well, that's also, yeah, I mean, listen, I'm on board from the very beginning on this film. There's no. <laughs> so the reason I've seen critters prior to this Killapalooza is my interest in a fucking horror legend, Mick Garris, Mm -hmm. who is actually the only director I know from the four of these movies, uh, except except Scott Levy, who didn't actually direct any of the Critters movies. He just made Men in White. Does this count as a third tagging, or do I have to wait to another show? No, you have to wait till another show. But we can do a previously on double feature for you. Mick Garris is, uh, I think... You know, if I'm just going to go right for most popular work that he's done besides the second Critters, he did the movie Hocus Pocus. I think everybody has seen at some point in their life Hocus Pocus. <laughs> but he's one of the big guys from Masters of Horror. Sure. And uh, Masters of Horror being the, I don't know, mid-2000 franchise, I think. It was a TV thing. I call it a franchise, but yeah, you're right. It's it's episodic. It's brilliant. And it's It's one of the things that horror film has needed since fucking 1970 it's like two seasons or something right yeah there's two seasons it's all these so here's how i remember this i might be totally wrong but i saw critters in preparation of seeing mcgarris speak at the music box that might not even be true i might already be wrong i have the memory of you know about a year and a half so after that it's all it it gets very fuzzy but i remember him talking about how Masters of Horror started because they were just having these annual dinners. Mm -hmm. Him and a bunch of guys who were involved in horror. Right. And so even though when you look at his filmography, I mean, it's it's Hocus Pocus, it's Critters 2, it's a sequel to The Fly from the late 80s nobody's ever even heard of. Didn't he do a psycho thing? Yeah, but he's done a lot of TV stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did some stuff for Freddy's Nightmares. Um, that thing that you and I watched, remember Happy Town? Oh yeah. <laughs> remember when we were watching Happy Town and then, uh, not Creep Show, but, uh, oh, now I feel bad saying Creep Show. Tales from the Crypt. That's what I wanted. <laughs> A lot of sort of anthology based, you know, films have started doing that, bringing entire, we talked about Trick or Treat, but mm-hmm. a lot of films recently horror anthologies packed into a single film. Right. But there was a big spot for that in television. And so McGarris was the guy who got all those people together. I feel like, I don't know if he's where his credits lie on Masters of Horror, but at the very least, he made it sound like he had the fucking idea right, to get all these guys together and do this. Or, I mean, if all he did was get them together for dinner and then somebody at the dinner said they should all work on a thing... That's fine. I'm still going to give him a heavy producer credit for that. And so the way that he comes in and treats the Critters franchise after this first installment, naturally it's going to set the tone for the next two. A tone that I feel like maybe they tried to run away from. But being the second movie, that's typically what happens is, you know, in the second or third film, that's where you go, what things are important to this franchise? If this is going to become a big franchise what's important what things are we keeping what is this really about Mm -hmm. the first movie is a lot of things what things do we mimic or amp up from that movie that sets the tone and the humor is the biggest thing for me because you know critters 2 makes jokes like it's not even trying to make jokes yeah i mean it's so casual and they're so plentiful they're just hanging out in the the fucking background of every frame Not all of them. There's some obvious gags and there's stuff that's played up and there's the Playboy thing and Mm -hmm. the Freddy cutout thing. Sure. 
stuff that's really ha ha. But uh, there's also a lot of stuff that it's almost like they made the joke in editing instead mm-hmm. of when they were filming. The joke was not written into the script. It was just something later they decided they could do. Think about like um, the eggs. Right. We know that the eggs are going to become Easter eggs. Sort of. I mean, at some point, that is sure. knowledge we have. But there's a moment where they're looking at the eggs and they're going, what are we even going to do with this? And the very next shot, fucking smash cut style, is the Easter egg banner. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just what do we even do with these eggs? Cut to another scene. We don't even really linger on it. It's not like just a static shot of that. It kind of pans away from here's a scene with this Easter egg banner setting up. Here's what we're going to do with it, mm-hmm. which is funny to me. I don't know how intentional that is as a joke. What else are you going to do with European eggs? There's also the cut from the Playboy magazine to the spaceship. Uh huh. You know, it's funny as you kind of make the connection of we just see the magazine sit there kind of hamster style where why, why are we focusing on a magazine? Is this an artistic way to end the scene or is that magazine perhaps going to come back uh-huh. for some reason? And the very next scene is... I was just trying to find the body that's right for him. Yeah. I mean, I think you make the connection there. And I think that's part of the humor of the movie. But that's the big thing. For you, you remember the ball from Critters 2. I remember the ball. I remember Critters 2 as the one where Lee is uh, Roxanne, the Playboy model. Well, it's also the one where Lee dies. Yeah. It's a ballsy move. Yeah, that's true as well. Yeah, so we get rid of of Lee. Uh, we give him at least an intentional death. A lot of the other characters we just never hear from again. Right. But yeah, setting up the, you know, it's a lot of kind of uh, sexist gags about, I think, a, you know, the third Terminator movie. Sure. The Terminator's taking the form of a woman now, and you have to have the fucking shot of going from robot flat chested to mm-hmm. expanding breasts. Ballooning breasts was like a thing of the 80s. Sure. Of, fucking prop gag of the 80s i think at some point in the 80s somebody made uh you know like a pneumatic tube air filled boob and they just decided to start putting it in movies as a gag well, they said what are we gonna do with these jump <laughs> right. cut to inflatable breast scene right so i think terminator 3 was the last movie to use it but for decades we were <laughs> pumping the breast. that's not true people are still putting those in movies today I'm surprised you've let me get this far without talking about Lynn Shea. Oh, man. So Lynn Shea is in both of these movies. I think her husband is one of the producers, Robert Shea. Oh, really? He ends up he ended up producing the first two, but he he and Lynn disappear after the second film. Right. And she plays an interesting character over the arc of the first two films because she's a she's like a police station receptionist in the first one. And then she's involved in the newspaper. With uh, Bernard from Lost. Yeah, right. I don't know if it's the same character. I don't know if it's the same person. Sure. But uh, I do know that her, she is one of those actors that um, for you, I guess, Emmett Walsh represents where the second I see her, I go, this is a horror movie. Come on, guys. (laughs) I mean, it could be terrible. It could be. Right. It doesn't matter. If Lynn Shea shows up, it presents me with this. She's kind of. For me, she represents this um, going to Thanksgiving dinner and Lin Shay brings you a live turkey and cuts its head off and bleeds all over everybody and everybody's having a great time. (laughs) But it's her house Uh, and you've gone to her house for Thanksgiving and you feel warm and welcome and everybody's all laughing at the sheer amount of turkey blood spraying all over everybody. To have her show up in a movie, it just makes me feel warm and welcome and hey, we're going to have a good horror time. I think I understand your analogy, although I feel like I need to call a professional. (laughs) I have concerns about your well-being. When was the first time we saw her in a movie? Oh, man, I'm going to go with 2001 Maniacs. Yeah, that was it, wasn't it? I think that was it. She was the granny in that? She's the granny, yeah, but she's also the teacher in the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Sure. And um, obviously she's got that role in Detroit Rock City. Oh, I was thinking Insidious. Yeah. That That was another one of recent memory. The first time we saw her, you were, you know, pay attention to this woman. She's a big deal. Yeah. And probably the second and third and fifth time. And I don't know, it just, uh, you know, when I was first learning about horror films, literally, I mean, on our show, I'd never seen any horror stuff before that. 
Look where we are now. <laughs> I was trying to collect who was going to be important and what. Yeah. And, you know, what capacity do people get involved in the genre? What names am I going to have to, to recognize? And Lin Shay was not one that I put on the map that I regret sure. every time we see her. I go, yeah, I really you put Robert Englund go back and, and Tony Todd and, and Kane Hodder. Well, listen, there were. I mean, when you think about sure. those names. Yeah. I think about her now almost as one of those. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she seems to have shown up in just as many fucking things. We could be playing spot the Shay, but I had a lot of names to sure, try and remember sure. when we were figuring out who Jason and Freddie were when I had to keep asking you which one is Kane Hodder. <laughs> so somebody I will pay more attention to. And as soon as I say that, we never see them again on, on the <laughs> show. Terrence Mann also returns. Terrence Mann returns. And. In Critters 2, that's the point where I go, oh, is Terrence Mann going to be the thing that I'm going to have to remember? I'm trying to figure out, is there going to be a person? Because I'd seen Critters 1 and 2 over and over. Mm -hmm. I had never seen Critters 3 and 4. So I had no idea what to expect after this. And keeping some of the same characters, I'm trying to go, who's going to be our... I want to say final girl, but that's not... (laughs) Who is our Nancy of the Critters franchise? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, is anyone going to make the return? So Terrence Mann is my guess at this point. Sure. Which kind of ends up being true. It is true. Bit. Terrence Mann and uh, Terrence Mann, who plays Ugg mm-hmm. and, um, and Charlie, are the two characters that stalwartly fight through all the Critters franchise. Right. They're also, I think, the reason for the biggest missteps in the franchise. <laughs> if I had to pick two things the franchise does horrendously wrong, uh-huh. it would be what becomes of Charlie and what becomes of Ugg. Let's not get there yet, because I feel like Charlie has a shining moment in this film I want to <laughs> talk about. Well, first, Charlie dies, but it's okay because Ugg looks like him, yeah. and then he didn't really die. Right. But in the moment where we thought Charlie died... There is a sparkling score flourish that goes, uh-huh. oh, but it's okay because Ugg looks like Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> Every, I guess everything's going to be all right, which is not fucking okay at all. Also, also, I really like the fact that he's been wandering through the fields outside of uh, Grover's Bend, and then he finds his way onto the street. And then for the first time, once the camera finally catches up with him, mm-hmm. he figures out how to remove the parachute. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it comes back pretty uh, pretty triumphantly. The shot at the end there when he comes back is one of my highlights from the whole franchise. Mm-hmm. Because as we're watching Killapaloozas, we started watching them really knowing like which ones were terrible and which ones were great, you know, which pieces of the franchise. Uh-huh. And the longer our show goes on, every piece of the Killapalooza just becomes an amazing party. And we, we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about, wow, this is really the worst fucking thing ever. Right. But man, is if there is a definitive moment in any of them, and I feel great saying this because it's in arguably the best Critters movie, the two Charlies at the end, that shot with the green screen outline oh, yeah. of the one where, Charlie. Where you're sitting there just going, how did they do that? No, I'm not because there's a green fucking <laughs> pencil outline around it. It has to be the worst green screening. <laughs> and I've they're, ever they're seen clearly in my not even life. looking at each other. I know, I know. They're not looking at each other at all. One of the Charlies is looking in the wrong fucking place altogether, and the other is kind of pivoting at the wrong speed. Yeah. And just a green pencil outline around him. It is uh, amazing, is the word I want. It's amazing. And then end your film with a crane shot. Sure. Because, you know, I ain't listening to no, no face space, man. Uh, Critters 3. Yes, finally, Leonardo DiCaprio, we got one. Yeah. <laughs> I knew I this would happen eventually. You gotta have one. While Critters is trying to do everything it needs to be a triple A slasher franchise in as little time as possible, mm-hmm. it realized that it did not yet have a starring one teen heartthrob. Sure. And two, a person who would go on to have a legitimate acting career that would then wish we forgot about right. Critters 3. Well, don't go out there and tout him as a teen heartthrob because this is the first thing he ever did. Well, but that's what I mean, though. So he transitioned from Critters to teen heartthrob. Within a probably three, four years. Well, and fairly amazingly for Leonardo DiCaprio, I think a lot of people don't even realize, you know, you and I grew up through 
eye rolling Leonardo DiCaprio teen heartthrob. Tiger Beat Magazine. Eric. Tiger it Beat was called People Tiger would not Beat Magazine. <laughs> fucking shut up about Leonardo DiCaprio teen heartthrob. And went on to, I mean, if you just started watching films today, you would think, oh yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio, one of the greats of our generation. Mm-hmm. You know, he's the, that actor who got his first film role back in uh, Titanic. Yeah, well, that would be the embarrassing critter's past. He was hiding as Titanic. Yeah, right. Oh, you, well, he used to do these big blockbuster love movies like Titanic, yeah. but then he went on to all this other stuff. Went on to Shutter Island. But far before that. He was an antichrist. Right, you got it. Although I think it's funny that Leonardo DiCaprio still has the same haircut in this movie that he's had for his entire yes. fucking career. Yes. Which is, uh, which is pretty great. Uh, so this film, before we get too deeply into the uh, Critters 3, um, this film is the first bizarre, massive misstep in the franchise for me. And it's, it's all in Charlie's character. Because if you recall from the second Critters film, Charlie ecstatically receives the sheriff's badge for Grover's Bend. Right. And then in this film, he shows up as some weird drunken bounty hunter outside the fringes of (laughs) Grover's Bend talking about Grover's Bend. (laughs) So you're going, what the fuck? How did this happen? How did he go from sheriff to bounty hunter in the woods? All right. So I'm going to throw out all I've got here and you're either going to accept it and recant your previous statement, or, I mean, that's it, and you win. I believe, I'll give you my premise first, and then my evidence. Okay. So the premise upon which I say this is okay is that I think that there is a lost Critters film worth of, there is a Shadows of the Empire hanging out between Critters 2 and Critters 3 that has the story of how Charlie went from, you know, place B to place C. Mm -hmm. Now I know you look at this and you just go, how was that woman a sheriff secretary and then a newspaper secretary and we don't even talk about it? You go, how was Charlie the sheriff of the town and then a crazy drunk in the woods and we're just, what, supposed to forget? We're retconning that he was the sheriff? Mm -hmm. I submit to you, no. The franchise knows that he was once the sheriff but has somehow in a mysterious story we have not yet told, become a crazy rambling drunk again. And as evidence of this, if you pay really close attention, and I only, I mean, I only caught this by accident. I did not actually go back and comb for details. (laughs) I wish I could, you know, only caught this by accident. Otherwise, I'd be totally agreeing with you. When you see him at the end, going through the caverns of Kansas, totally not LA, but Kansas, as we find out in the next movie. Uh huh. Uh, and he reaches down for the little remote thing that they call back to. Uh huh. Slightly different design. Sure. But it, whatever. Same remote. Yeah. He pushes his coat past his waist. Uh huh. And as part of his overall costume, his collection of trinkets and crazy shit from his travels. Sure. Is his sheriff badge, his former sheriff badge. That's sitting weird. On like a, I don't know, on a on his belt or something. So I think that's the movie going. That sheriff thing was an episode of his life, but some crazy fucking incident happens. Alcoholism. He it's not crazy. To, well, it might also. I mean, who knows what that story is? But that was kind of an awesome moment for it me is, because I really, went, "Wow, there's a whole interesting thing that happened to Charlie." That I don't know if it's the interesting. Film, <laughs> Well, honestly, the film just went, we don't want him in that role. We want him in this role. So whatever. But they leave an opening for me to be imaginative and go, what what is the lost Charlie Mm -hmm. chapter? What happened to Charlie? Okay, I'll I'll give you that. But what I don't understand then, Eric, here's another one, is how did we go from Critters 2, which is innumerable amounts of critters forming a ball, running (laughs) over townspeople and devouring them to bone, to, I don't know, like, three-ish critters, and they're all actually just gremlins in fuzzy costumes. Oh, I have the answer to that one, too, because we beat gremlins. (laughs) New Lines creates this. uh, I mean, I wanted to say, you know, to capitalize on gremlins. And if that was not the case, if that's not where its origin point is, you cannot deny that in production, everyone was thinking about gremlins. Mm -hmm. It's certainly something that when they're green lighting these movies, they're going, 
well, we've got to, you know, we've got to keep up with gremlins. We've got to keep thwarting the gremlins threat. <laughs> and at, uh, at three movies, we've officially beat gremlins. Yeah. So I think they just, that was their way to celebrate. They just phoned it in. They, went, they did. Let's blow every critter we have on the second movie. And then once we win and Gremlins admits defeat, then uh, we can just, we'll just do Gremlins. Yeah. We could, well, one, we can only have a few critters. And two, the critters could be acting the most Gremlins. They've, sure. They fucking acted the whole, they even have personalities. One gets a name. Yeah. I mean, that's the uh, thing. It's ridiculous. And I mean, yeah. short, of, short of abusive John Waters' dad. It's the most familiar <laughs> thing in the entire movie for me. Yeah, right. So this 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 film loses almost its entire cast from the second film. We get Charlie. We're introduced to a new family. There's an orphan. We kind only of. kind of have Charlie. He shows up at the beginning and the end. Yeah, and he's he's a different character. I mean, he looks like he's been eating. <laughs> and then uh, and we get the weird ending with hologram Ugg, which. Which we straight up just show later on again in the next film. I mean, well, hold on for a second. Critters three pulls that trick twice because Charlie also does previously on Critters earlier in the film. That's true. Critters three is probably about forty five minutes of footage. Yeah. Well, you that think does not appear in another movie. Wait until we get to Critters four, because there are some really bizarre things going on in the production of that film as well. Well, these two were shot back to back right so i think you know we have we decided charlie and ugg are going to be critters four that's where the real story's at uh -huh. we just need some filler for critters three why well because i don't know why i mean I don't, I don't fucking know why they need the dicaprio credit i think that's one of the reasons we just move charlie into a totally new role and don't talk about it mm -hmm. because the last thing we want to do is pay charlie for more screen time we want to pay Charlie for less screen time, but give the illusion that he is our leading man for mm -hmm. the franchise. Right. So they have him around so he can be in Critters 4. They chuck him in a couple scenes in Critters 3, but to explain how he went from sheriff to drunk in the woods requires <laughs> more Charlie, and we don't have Charlie on loan for that right. long. We've only paid Fair him enough. for one film. Fair enough. But Amy Brooks, the girl from Monster Man, we have uh -huh. her and Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio for the whole thing. <laughs> so let's just use that relationship as much as we can. And uh, the Critters, well, and I think the other thing that happened is they took the ball of Critters from Critters 2 uh -huh. and then split them off between the two sure. films. Well, don't forget, don't forget, you can't just chalk off the little boy from Kindergarten Cop. Yes, I can. <laughs> this film has the most Says famous who? cast of since the first film i mean we have yeah we have emmett walsh lynn shea and d wallace okay so those are actual names <laughs> in the first film the second yeah. film has none of those characters <laughs> except lynn shea <laughs> and uh, -huh. uh bernard from lost right and now we've got <laughs> at least in double feature history a massive onslaught of actors because we're talking dicaprio and then we got Little Kid from Kindergarten Cop and Girl from Monster Man. So we're back in famous territory, at least. Well, also famous for Double Feature. I think this was the one that, um, uh, was it Christine Peterson? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was the one she was involved in. Actually, I think she was the director of this, right, wasn't she? Right, she was, yeah. So maybe I, uh, maybe I do know other Critters directors. Christine Peterson did, she was second unit on Tremors, but she did... Actually, I think she was second unit on basically everything. I think this is the only thing she has an official director's credit for that we've done. Yeah. But she did second unit then on Tremors and on uh, one of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, maybe mm -hmm. the fifth one. Fire P. Yeah, that was right. That was right. Because if we were thinking, wow, time to talk about female director. Ah, but Fire P. Maybe <laughs> not time to talk about female director. And uh, Reform School Girls. That was the other one uh, that Reform she worked School on. Girls. Fucking great. Yeah. Okay, so Critters 3 is not without its merit, but its merit is definitely not beyond its one-sheet poster. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the one uh, that has Critters Take LA on the cover and then a little... Yeah. What, what is it, like a little circle with Leonardo DiCaprio's head in, uh -huh. in the corner? <laughs> <laughs> with, I think, next to it in font just as big as Critters 3, it says, please see this movie. Oh, no, it says starring Leonardo DiCaprio. That's, uh -huh. that's what it says. Oh, Critters to Take L.A., another move that uh, we're going to have a AAA title. We, uh, we've 
listen, Gremlin's no longer on our radar as the threat. The threat is now Jason. And right. if we're going to surpass Jason, we got to take LA. We've got to take a city. And Jason's already taken Manhattan. Well, that's the perfect thing because you have Manhattan, the city of all cities. You know, New York, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Probably the only place that uh, as Chicago citizens, we would look at as well. There, there is one place bigger and crazier in New York, but let's not give them any credit. Let's talk about Chicago. Well, Predator's already taken care of that. But. <laughs> so then we have LA, which is the laziest city you could take, especially sure. as filmmakers. Yeah. Because it's not really a city. Exactly. And we pretend it's a city because movies are made there. Yeah. It's your backyard. Exactly. It's, well, Critters has to take a city. Uh, I don't know. LA's, LA's a 20-minute drive. They'll just take LA. And then we almost have a bottle film of uh, Mulberry Street style, you know, trapped in the apartment. The Critters are coming to get us. But that's it. I mean, the Critters have apparently, with Critters 3, their terror reign on Earth, has, they've been sufficiently fed. I think you give Critters 3 a hard time, though. I think it's also got, first of all, it continues our bowling <laughs> illusions that have been happening in every movie so far although the second one was more a little more creative in that the third one just goes right back to showing you people bowling uh we also get some new weaponry that runs off pinto beans that's a very right. important part of so <laughs> i think the weaponry is really interesting in this uh franchise you also get biggest fucking meat cleaver i've ever seen in my life oh that's so weird <laughs> we always look for who's got the biggest cleaver, uh -huh. but uh, this one is just a fucking sword. Yeah. <laughs> it's huge. And the slasher point of view shots. Sure. Which uh, are even better at the critter's height. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of that child's play height. Sure. Again, just another thing you got to do if you're going to have a slasher franchise. All right. I, clearly, you are dying to talk about Critters 4. I'm not going to stand in the way of you and Critters 4. So Critters 4, Eric. Critters 4 takes place in outer space. It starts exactly where Critters 3 ends. In Kansas. What happened to LA? Was I, did I fall asleep for a second? I, here? I was under the impression that Charlie at the end of Critters 3 was in LA in some caverns. Critters 4 opens and it goes, nope, that's Kansas. Yeah. Okay, whatever. That's fine. So, <laughs> so Charlie gets in a pod. And with the last remaining Krite eggs in existence and is blasted off into outer space at the demand of his old friend, Ugg. And then here we are in outer space with uh, Angela Bassett and Brad DeRiff and some other actors, I'm sure, that have had <laughs> careers. Oh, come on, man. Bernie was in Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. You're not going <laughs> to give him any... He was also in Twin Peaks and Firewalk with me. That's where I actually know that actor. Right. But, you know, he, he was in another Killapalooza. You should get some credit. Sure, sure. So we get uh, what I think is a really good premise. And four is not, it's by no, there. it's no feat to make your fourth film in outer space. Again, following in the footsteps of Leprechaun. <laughs> right. But sure. this film's premise is there are two Krite eggs left in the world. And these basically space bounty hunter contractor types come upon them and Terracor needs to acquire them for now if we're to believe what is said at the end of the third <laughs> film they need to acquire them because it's illegal in outer space to kill off an entire species and i love that yeah i love the benevolence of you can't kill a species even if they're horrible yeah for sure but then it turns into they're a super weapon that can destroy planets in a matter of months and and whatever. So here, anyway, forgetting all of that, now we've set the premise and fuck that. Here's what's interesting to me about this film, Eric. Charlie returns. Ugg comes in over a monitor. Uh, I mean, we, we have at least those characters. But what we don't have is a movie that is purely Critters 4. Yeah. What am I saying? What am I talking about? Terracor is actually a company that was initially used in a film called android i don't know anything about this now wait you're going to love this i'm scared so android is one of the only other films starring don keith opper huh. who plays charlie right in the critters franchise now i know what you're thinking you're thinking wait is android did we miss one is what i'm thinking part of the critters universe exactly but that's not the case 
Okay. The case is instead, let's use some footage from Android so we don't have to f- shoot entirely new footage. No. Of Don Keith Opera in outer space. <laughs> what are you talking about? I shit you not. What are you talking about? Some of the about? space footage is from <laughs> most, a lot of the space footage is from it Critters is 1 and Android. <laughs> No, it's not. It is. <laughs> With the big gun and everything. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Why how did I not notice this? So this film is partially Critters 4 and partially Android, and it uses the same evil corporation, Terracore. Alright. And so we get a bizarre film where Don Hopper shows up, but he's also actually just being in another movie. And then the crew of this ship is being eaten by, what, a crate and a half? Okay, so there is some Don Hopper in the movie that is shot exclusively for the movie. Sure. Right? Right. Anything where he's with an actor from the film. And then they just took the other... (laughs) Can that even really be... Okay. All right, hold on. Let's go back for a second here. Let's just put aside the intellectual property problems here because I'm sure they work themselves out. So if this was a movie he was in before, then maybe it's a new line movie. Maybe they have rights to it. I'm sure they're only using the footage because they could get it for cheaper than to actually film new footage, if Mm -hmm. not for free. Mm -hmm. Can it really be that cheaper logistically from like a uh, project management standpoint, <laughs> does it make more sense when you're budgeting out the film, you're the producer in charge of finance, to go, well, let's actually comb through Android, find usable scenes, splice them out and put them in our movie, than just going, well, we have Don around for this many hours, just have him do things. I mean, yeah. did they only film like 45 minutes of stuff and I d- then I have mean, to pad it out? I don't know the answers to these I questions. I don't understand how this makes production sense. I don't know the answers to these well, questions. Well, speculate wildly. I, I think that for whatever reason, it's just, th- I don't, you know, here's, here's my wild speculation based on Critters 3 and Critters 4 and my knowledge of where Don Opper shows up in these films. Somebody making Critters really doesn't like him. <laughs> 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 and so in an effort to spend as little okay, time paying right. and working with Don Opera as possible, uh, they're just going to use other footage. Okay, so I am really curious why um, why not just have Don Opera act in the scenes. I, You know, the natural thing my mind goes towards is it's too expensive. Uh-huh. Well, he, maybe so, he's just, he need, maybe Colin Farrell wants too much money. So other clues we have to look toward are, you know, Ugg appears in the movie. Yeah, for a basically what is an afternoon of shooting. But he's horrendously evil and doesn't even recognize Don Opper. <laughs> well, and yeah, what is that about? I don't get it. Uh, this fil- that's That was the other thing I was, I was alluding to back when we were discussing Critters 2, is why the hell is Ugg suddenly evil? Well, because time changes things. And it's been 50 years. And, and he got a promotion. I actually kind of like that. I'm going to explain why, uh-huh. even though I'm not married to it. I like it because it's been 50 years, and to us, we see Charlie and Ugg as the staple of the series. Mm-hmm. They're this, this fucking power duo of bounty hunters, and they're, at, you know, they're central to everything that happens. But in the real timeline, Charlie was in Ugg's life for you know three weeks, yeah. 50 years ago. So Ugg does not give a fuck about Charlie, <laughs> <laughs> because really, it seems really important to us and a little less important to Charlie, and it can't be important to Ugg at all, because it was 50 years ago. I mean, I just had trouble remembering what the fuck happened in Leprechaun and the difference between close-up on a photo and photos of you. Uh I don't think I would remember... I definitely don't remember what happened 50 years ago. So, I mean, that's all I got for Ugg. Or he's kind of a dick, I don't know. I think both, but fortunately, Charlie knows how to use a revolver. And that's very disappointing to Brad Dourif in this film. Yeah, I was going to say, can we get back to Brad Dourif? Why are we talking about Brad Dourif? So Brad Dourif is in this film, and that automatically makes it my favorite Critters movie. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Brad Dourif, I missed you. Oh, I'm so excited. Brad Dourif coming back for Curse of Chucky. How have we not talked? This is the wrong time to talk about Curse of Chucky, but uh, we didn't cover it on the year ender Mm -hmm. when the, you know, actual new pieces of information were making their way out there. 
I guess only to say I'm excited. That's really the only reason I, yeah. I bring it up. So uh, Brad Dariff. Um, voice of Chucky, Brad Dariff. Voice and last seen on our show, let's say in a Jeremy Caston Prophecy film. 3. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it wasn't that long ago. It was <laughs> uh, where he was like an opium smoking right. store clerk or something. Sure. That's how I remember that movie going. No, Brad Dariff, actually, aside from being one of my favorite actors, his character in this film is one of my favorite characters in all of Critters. Mm -hmm. He's the only one who seems to have any sense about him in this scenario, and he also doesn't like when people beat up his crew. Sure. And so he goes down like a champ. He takes a shot to the gut, and he dies in the final scene of who is going to win in the Critters franchise. Will it be, <laughs> right. will it be Charlie? <laughs> Will it be Terracor from the film Android, or will it be, <laughs> or will it be the last remaining Krite family who's just trying to pack a spaceship and leave? Oh my God! This film. I also love that it's two Krites. I don't oh, like yeah. aliens over alien. You know. Yeah. I think stick with fewer creatures is great. So we throw two of them on a ship, and we say go at it. I think that's awesome. I love that. Well, about the more it. you have, the less of a the less of a challenge it becomes. You put twenty krites on that ship, and if they survive, I'm going to be pissed off. Right. I've right. seen I've seen what twenty krites do to an entire farm town. Right. So you can't sell me on twenty krites get defeated on a spaceship. So you're listing contenders for the end of the movie. I know the uh, captain who's doing a terrible Picard does not make your list. No, that's not just me, right? right. Terrible Picard oh, yeah. is. Oh yeah. Basically, that was his. Um, hey, what am I doing in this movie? I don't know. Be like Picard. That's what we want you to do. I think Next Generation was probably a thing when this was being made, right? Oh, yeah. This was in the 90s. Next Generation was really strong okay. through the 80s. I was going to say, again, the, the internet would probably give me the answer to that. This is space and the future. Mm -hmm. So that makes it a little bit different than previously just space. But for 2045, it sure looks like the early 90s to me. Yep. I don't think I've ever seen a future that was so unintentionally not futuristic at all. Well, I'm just, I'm always pleased to see that in the future, we will run our, our ships on DOS mode. It's, it has to be. We talked on uh, Bicentennial Man was where we talked about ambitious, mm -hmm. being as creative as you can and thinking about the future and then pushing it even further and even further beyond that. Just constantly challenging yourself as a visionary of filmmaking mm -hmm. to create worlds unlike any that modern man has seen this might be the least ambitious future i think we've ever seen on a screen ever <laughs> even worse than the sort of you know um barbarella things are in space that just happen to be laying around right on the studio set i pick on barbarella but i think that was actually uh, it was a fairly creative. It was a very distinct look for its well, own type of future. I mean, let's let's go to fucking remember Christmas on Mars. Sure, yeah. remember those well, those things. <laughs> all right, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe when you only have stuff laying around and you use it to create your future, you actually create a more visionary sure. future, a more creative future. But here we are, fifty years uh, in the future, fifty years forward in the future in the Critters franchise. And I think the only thing they have that we don't have now in 2013 reality is, uh, what, consumer-level laser guns? Yeah. And independent space travel, mm -hmm. which, as you already hit on, is something we're moving toward right. rapidly. <laughs> uh, 2013 is far more advanced than the Critters 2045. Even our versions of the stuff they have like their computer systems right. are fucking way more futuristic than, you know, the systems in the movies. It's kind of scary to think about though. Part of that is we're at a halfway point. Mm -hmm. I don't like thinking about, you know, they, they go 50 years in the future. We're what, like 25 years in the future, yeah. 20 years in the future. When was this made? 1991. We're halfway there. Yeah. Let's talk about something else. Uh, three minute core warning. Let's talk about that. That was my other favorite thing from the fourth one is the robot that they all hate, mm -hmm. which is also sure it, it's some of the best and some of the worst scenes in the movie. It's really interesting how they turn the Asimovian three rules on their head with that robot. Sure. You know what I'm talking about? Where yeah, definitely. It, it must obey humans unless and 
And this is interesting because the, it's programmed to only obey people with certain clearance. So then tell it to not obey you. It's Boolean logic programmed to disobey people who do not have the clearance. Mm-hmm. But uh, they reduce that into the, you know, the very simplistic, the computer is stupid, mm-hmm. which, okay, I guess that's fine. But there, um, the three minute core warning at the end where for your listening pleasure, I've selected a track with a running time of three minutes. Mm hmm is awesome all right so now that we're in space Mm -hmm. we've only got two critters while totally the wrong time in our show to take a look at the critters themselves this is the easiest opportunity right to do that yeah we know what they look like we've seen them through the whole franchise uh this has i mean was a fairly long time ago no talk on the horizon about critters five no it's not happening so we have the entire we know what the critters are. I mean, are. so if we want to boil it down to something scientific, they're an invasive species from another universe that are sentient enough to pilot spaceships and speak in subtitled languages, and they travel not by walking, but by rolling. And that's their big iconography, is these rolling balls of fur uh, that they have these spines that they shoot that do varying things depending on the film they're in right and they have multiple rows of teeth that they can use to eat anything whether it's a stool or the wiring or your dad right i mean they can even eat uh they can even eat firecrackers sure it kills them but they don't care because they're just hungry little fucking creatures that populate by european eggs and i also think that the critters always feel like characters in the movie they never feel like a prop. And sure. I mean that, I don't mean that really pretentiously. I literally mean they just do a good job with the creature effects. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we get slasher movies that forget they're about the slasher. Sure. And so we just, you know, we have a unanimated doll of something just right. sitting around. It's, I'm not making a, a joke about child's play. Right. I'm trying to think of a good example. I think Aliens is a good example. Oh, sure. I think you you get into the second and third alien films. The first film is it's man versus this superhuman creature. Right. Then immediately you get into man versus a swarm of bugs. Right. And the bugs lose their identity as a as a character and become a force. Well, even beyond a force, I think they're just not animated very well by the end of the franchise. Yeah, that's true. Well, the third one especially. Yeah, the third one was a big moment for that, and I think about it in the Alien versus Predator stuff as well. Sure. Where there are scenes where they just n- did not take enough time with the treatments of the alien. Mm-hmm. You start feeling like that's just kind of someone standing around. They're not in character. Right. Especially when you have these things that are I mean, you could hold them in your hand, the critters. They're that small. It would be so easy in a cheap, quickly made film to just dart the camera over to, you know, the side of a room where we've just flung two critters props Mm -hmm. and they're just sitting there. But they always feel like they're moving. They always move and and they laugh. Alive. Yeah. And it's what it's what kind of as much as we always say this is the critters are the reason that the franchise ever got made into four films because people like watching weird little shit eat people right we talk about charlie like he's the reason but charlie is just yeah hey we could put a character in this movie from all the movies sure um but we look at other franchises like the amityville horror or children of the corn and going up against those i mean they didn't even have a consistent right you know monster It could be argued in the defense of those franchises that it was about the havoc of a place, you know, Mm -hmm. upon humans. Or the havoc of he who walks behind the rose. But, you know, the treatment of the horror presence in those movies is not always kept as a very high priority. Mm -hmm. And I think that's definitely something you can say of Critters, is that we are always focused on making those little fucking balls of fur, getting those right every single scene. So I'm glad we could take a look back on our actual, let's go ahead and call them our actual slasher, mm-hmm. uh, the critters. But something we've neglected to do in some of the Killapaloozas, especially as they've gotten shorter, is recount which fucking movie were we talking about when. Mm-hmm. So First first Critters film, Farm Family uh, gets attacked by aliens and their cow hand and some shapeshifters from space 
have to put them down. All right. Second film, child from the first family returns to his hometown where he and the drunk farmhand go head to head against a giant ball of critters. Sure. And that's the Mick Garris one. The Easter Bunny one. (laughs) Right. The Easter one. Sure. Oh, and the Playboy one. Right. Can't forget that. Yep. It's also, the second one is also the Playboy one. Mm -hmm. Good. Then we have Critters 3, which is DiCaprio in LA. Right. Made back to back with Critters 4 and um, using some scene bleed over at the end (laughs) uh, to tie the two together. And then we have Critters 4, also known as Android 2, which takes place (laughs) entirely in space uh, where Charlie and a team of space pirates battle two critters until the evil space conglomerate Terracor comes and decides to use the critters as a weapon. Thusly wrapping up the Critters franchise and taking care of every last critter once and for all, even though I'm pretty sure we did that in the second movie. Right. Halfway through the franchise, you know, we get to the third movie. Why are there eggs under that car? I don't know. Why are there still critters on Earth? (laughs) We didn't leave any. There was no dun, 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 there's still eggs scene like at the end of right. whatever. It's fine. Uh, we have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. People actually missed these, these Killapaloozas. Can you hmm. believe that? They missed them. All right. As in wanted more of them. <laughs> but I guess it makes sense that the people who would want more of the slasher franchises, more uh, soulless, terribly made uh, sequels, would also want more soulless, terribly made double feature episodes. That's true. And they write to us. They write to us using doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. We have a bunch of producers who ensured not only that there was a year six, but uh, also helped ensure, along with all of our Kickstarter backers, that we hit our stretch goal and were able to do a a legitimate amount of Killapaloozas, a formidable amount of Killapaloozas this year. And those executive producers are Flint Ironstag, Max Harley, Meta Somerville, and Hannah Hughes. Now, Michael, don't we also have... Um, two movies that we're going to do next time on the show. We do. Not only do we have two films that we're doing next time on the show, Eric, one of them was chosen by one of our Kickstarter backers. Um, and we're pairing that with, we're, we're going to go ahead and straight up do Cartoon Disney. Have we done that? I don't think we've ever done that. No. I. Uh, so I really wanted to throw one of these in this year. I think and, this is the logical foray. You know, every time we do it, we hedge our bets. We go Tron or something like that. Sure. We cheat a little bit. We're still cheating. And this still feels like cheating. I know. I know it, it You does, know why it feels like cheating that. is because it's not a musical. So you think it's until we get to a musical? I think, we'll... I think it's until we get to a musical. I feel like we'll have to do one that we don't want to do and mm-hmm. has nothing to fucking talk about. So we're going to do It's Such a Beautiful Day, and we're going to pair that with Disney's Alice in Wonderland. So that's going to be the Alice in Wonderland from 1951. Yeah. <laughs> and It's Such a Beautiful Day um, is going to be a little trickier to get, but actually it's not tricky. I mean, you find it on Vimeo. And you can uh, you can buy it for like two bucks. Awesome. So buy the movie and we'll pair it up with Alice in Wonderland next time. All right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.